Hello, and welcome to Making Sense of It. I am Mona Duncan, your host, and each week we have a member of the Glasser Institute for Choice Theory telling us about how they use the concepts, and uh, our speaker today is Ron Modern, Modern and uh, he's going to be talking about using choice theory and reality therapy in teaching students and overcoming uh, in substance abuse. So uh, welcome everyone and hello Ron and Wendell that are here thus far and uh, we're ready for you to take it away. Okay all right thank you for having me back. Um, yeah using uh, choice theory and reality therapy and treating substance use disorders that's something that I've done for, uh, that's really where I started at. So it's been 22 years since I've started doing that. Uh, so it's something that, um, uh, something that I've, I've used quite a bit. Uh, this was, I just put this up here. This some of the things I'm not going to go into great detail about, but um, um, most everybody, everybody who's here right now knows about them anyway. So, <laughs> but, but if somebody else is, uh, is coming in, then uh, the last article I had in the journal was that it was populating quality world, a neurobiological explanation. So really looking at when we use uh, terms like the quality world and we talk about it as a picture album or we talk about it as a mental mosaic, what are we really talking about when we, when we say that? So some of the things I'll talk about is there. Now, uh, picture, we know that pictures get in our quality world in a couple of ways, a couple of ways with uh, alcohol and other drugs. Uh, one way that they get in there is uh, that just the things we do fulfill the basic needs, right? And that's how anything gets in our uh, quality world, right? The creating place creates behavior. We act on that behavior. If it uh, fulfills our needs, that picture gets in the quality world. If it doesn't, then uh, the glial cells come by sooner or later and prune, prune that out, right? Uh, and uh, alcohol and other drugs can get in there in that way. And I usually use, as I'm as teaching this, uh, this example from that show Cheers, right? Some of us remember that, the show Cheers there. And, uh, you know, the fat guy walks into the bar and everybody yells, Norm, right? So he, and he goes to the bar, he, he gets, his, uh, gets his recognition needs met, gets some belonging needs met there, the chair that he sits on, that's his stool, nobody, and nobody else sits there but him. Uh, seems to have fun there, that's sort of what the show's about. So he's having fun and getting that need met, and he's always trying to get away from his wife, Vera. So he gets the freedom need met. So he gets all of those psychological needs met, and if we, if we look at beer as food, maybe he gets the survival need met too. He might, he might get all five of them met there. But at the very least, the, uh, the psychological needs. And like I said, that's how anything gets in our, uh, to be a picture in a quality world. Alcohol and other drugs are a little different because they can get in the quality world, not only uh, that way, but by also fooling the brain into thinking that the basic needs have been met. Now, now that picture you're seeing doesn't really have anything to do <laughs> with that topic. Uh, that's the uh, spec scans of what the brains of uh, drug users look like. Okay, so uh, we can see the spec scan there for alcohol, meth, marijuana, cocaine. The one in the middle, that's uh, top view and bottom view of a healthy brain. But uh, uh, just interesting there. But alcohol and other drug fools the brain into thinking that the needs have been met. It does that, uh, the way it does that is because we're motivated by pleasure and pain, right? Uh, which psychologically are happiness and misery. But uh, when we do something that uh, causes us to feel pleasure, then uh, that tells us we need to do more of it. Tells us that our needs were met in some way, we need to continue to do it. And certainly alcohol and other drugs do that, at least in the beginning, right? So we feel that, uh, feel that happiness, that euphoria, feel that pleasure that we have, and uh, if we look at uh, withdrawal, then uh, we might look at the pain of when we don't uh, continue using those drugs as well. So, uh, you know, Glasser, one of my, one of my favorite, um, favorite of his books was um, uh, when he really went into that. And I can't think of the name. I'm going to have to look, <laughs> look on my bookcase for the name of it. Uh, but uh, uh, when he went into how alcohol and other drugs really affected the brain and what have you, it was one, it was one of the earlier books. I can't, I can't think of the name of it right now. Uh, but anyway, 
so that's what that's the other way that alcohol and other drugs can be a picture, get to be a picture in our quality world. Is it really fools the brain? Does it meet the psychological needs only if it meets them in the first way, like everything else does? But eventually it doesn't, right? Eventually it becomes um, becomes problematic. So um, what what do we do about that? <laughs> so what's what's those pictures get in the quality world? Uh, that can become a problem and it can become a problem in many different ways. So what we have here is a picture of the sort of the hedonic set point, right? We all have a hedonic set point. And as we do things in life, we can look at that little green wavy line there and it goes up and down. And then the sort of the median of that, that's, uh, that's the hedonic set point. Uh, you know, the two biggest things naturally that cause spikes in that and the dopamine in the body are food and sex, right? Those are the two biggest ones we have. However, something like methamphetamines is many, many times more powerful than the best food or sex you'll ever have. Um, although addicts tell me that uh, sex on methamphetamine is better, but I don't know that from personal experience. <laughs> Uh, one of the little hurdles we have to overcome when we deal with this population. Uh, but uh, so that hedonic set point is there. But as they continue to use, especially things like stimulants, especially things like methamphetamines, cocaine, MDMA, which is a type of methamphetamine, then what happens is that little green, those peaks on that little green line there go up. Okay. They continue to rise. And eventually what will happen is that hedonic set point will move up. Okay. And uh, when that happens, uh, then, then there's a problem because once that moves up and that process is uh, called allostasis, right? Uh, once that moves up and then they decide, well, I need to stop using, I need to stop using drugs. Well, they stop using, but guess what? That hedonic set point is still up there about 40 times the level that it is normally, which means that any pleasure that they experience in their life is gonna be severely muted at that point, okay? So uh, one of the things is just sort of education and uh, telling people, you know, this will eventually go down if they don't, if they don't continue to use that hedonic set point will, uh, will continue, eventually drop back down to normal. Uh, but until then, they're gonna go through, they're gonna go through, go through a very rough time uh, once that hedonic set point moves. Now, uh, as far as the treatment uh, that I use go, besides the education there, uh, this was in my, this is in my book, Choose Wisely, okay, <laughs> available on Amazon.com, just saying, uh, <laughs> but anyway, this is there. Uh, actually, this was, this book came from the, uh, this was my presentation for uh, certification week, uh, so eventually it just, just became, became that, uh, made, to, made a few changes in it, what have you. But there's a few things that I need. So to help people look at needs and really look at recognition and strength needs, uh, I have a little game that I play called I Need It Not and I Need It A Lot. Now, there's a lot of these games out there. You probably have some that you use yourself. Uh, this one here is what I have people do is I have them and we're focusing on primarily the psychological needs, right? So I have them take a paper, divide it into four parts. And it's always interesting to see how they divide that paper in four parts. But anyway, uh, under each one of them, they put one of the psychological needs on one of the, each parts of the paper. And then I have them list everything in their life that fulfills that need for them or that they want that will fulfill that need for them. And then once they've got that done, once I give them a few minutes to do that, and once they've got those filled out, then I tell them that there has been a psychic catastrophe in the world and they have to give up one of those needs, which means they're giving up whatever's underneath it as well, right? So I usually begin that exercise by just having them explain the needs and what have you as we go through. And I'll ask them to rate their needs, right? You know, one to 10 on each one, of each of the four psychological needs. So that's, I just put that up on the board underneath their name. Then when I tell them they have to give one of them up, Whichever one they give up, we go back and look at that. And almost invariably, it is not, the one they give up is, should be the least important to them, right? That's the first one they give up. So that should be the least important. And invariably, it is almost always, so it's not invariably, but almost always, uh, it's not what they listed as their least uh, favorite one. 
Right. Uh, sometimes it's the exact opposite. Sometimes it's their it's their it's their most needed one that they that they think. So uh, we do that until we get to the last one, and of course, the last one they're holding that should be the one that is the strongest need strength, right? That's the one they want the most as they have to go through this. And usually, what I tell them is is that you know, uh, take that little piece of paper that you have, and just incidentally, let, let me just throw in there that um, you know. Almost always, the one that they keep is belonging. Not always, okay? There are some people who don't keep that. But Glasser was pretty was pretty correct on that. I mean, he based that on his experience. He said that's the biggest need, right, for most people. And that's generally what we find uh, when we play this game is that most people hold on to that need for belonging because underneath that is the pictures of their family, their kids, these sorts of, these their friends, these sorts of things. So they'll hold on to that one last. And what I tell them is, is, I say, take that little piece of paper and fold it up and put it in your purse, put it in your wallet, whatever it is, carry it around with you. And the next time you have a choice to make on whether or not you're going to go down this path of using, ask yourself, is this going to get me closer to this picture that I have in my pocket? Is this going to get me closer to these things or is this going to get me further away from them? Okay, so uh, that's just one of the little games that we play in there. Also, I use just for, you know, to get them used to the needs and different ways to look at them. I, um, oops, sorry about that. Uh, different ways to look at them. Also use some poetry. Uh, there's a three that I use that I like a lot. Uh, Love is not all by Edna St. Vincent Millay. Uh, I think that's a, that's a wonderful one to look at uh, love. Richard Corey, uh, if you're familiar with those, Edward Arlington Robinson um, was, uh, you know, a rich guy who killed himself. So uh, money's not everything, right? Uh, so we have other needs that have to be met. And of course, it's not ever money. It's what money can get us, right? And then men of her TV, and especially that one, uh, as far as uh, alcohol and other drugs go, uh, because, you know, men of her TV just scratches his head and keeps on drinking, right? So, because he doesn't get to fulfill the needs uh, <laughs> in his quality world. So, uh, so use some of that for a needs recognition. And then I'll just usually give them four, um, you know, four blank spaces and each one of those blank spaces will be one of the psychological needs, right? And that's when I ask them, what is it that you really, what's the, what's the most uh, important thing to you under each one of those? What do you want that will fulfill that the best? And just have them draw pictures. And, you know, it's, you know, it's not an art class. <laughs> Stick figures are fine. Uh, and have them do that. Although I must say that, uh, you know, I often get creative people in there who, give me works of art on those, uh, but other people just uh, the stick figures and those are fine. And those can be very, um, very interesting. Those can be very enlightening as well. Um, I remember I was at uh, one of the conventions. It was the convention that we had in uh, Colorado. Um, where is Pikes Peak? Where is that in Colorado? Wherever that is, wherever that is, we had a convention there. <laughs> <laughs> it might have been a regional one, but but there was one there. And uh, one of the speakers was talking about, uh, he was a child psychologist, and he was talking about how he had had a client, a little girl, who had drawn a picture of her, and behind her were the Rocky Mountains, and you know how kids draw mountains, just like that. And he said the, psych the psychiatrist that he had uh, saw the picture, and then started to talk about how the picture represented, you know, the maternal uh, longing for the, the female breasts and all of a sudden we could tell because they're in the background. And he was like, he must not have ever been to Colorado, right? <laughs> so, so he was talking that, but sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes a cigar is a cigar, but other times it can be very enlightening. So uh, for example, one time I had a woman who drew under the picture of belonging, she had stick figures, but she had two of the stick figures, which was obviously her and her child, you know, big picture, little picture, uh, her and her child with the round heads. And then there were several people in the back, but they all had square heads. And so I said, well, this is interesting. Why, <laughs> why do these people back here have square heads? And she said, well, she said, I'm in an interracial relationship and my family is opposed to it. So her family was blockheads, right? <laughs> so, so sometimes 
sort of interpreting the picture can um, can give us some more insight. I had um, I had one guy one time who drew one. Once again, it was under belonging. He had him, his family, his wife, his kids, and uh, everybody had a smile on their face except the wife, who uh, who had no mouth at all. And I said, okay, well, you know, is this just an error or why does the wife have no mouth? And he said, well, she's always talking and I want her to shut up. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so sometimes these things can be, uh, these things can be uh, revealing to us if we, if we look at the pictures closely and go into them. Uh, I resist having them, you know, sometimes people will say, you know, can we cut out pictures? I don't want to draw them. Can we cut them out of my mind? No, for this reason. Right. For this very reason, this is the reason I wanted to draw. Uh, like I said, even with stick figures. And I always tell them also no symbols. OK, if you draw a heart on there, you better need a heart transplant. OK, so a heart, you know, usually for love, they'll put a heart under there. Well, no, that's that's symbolic. I want no symbols. What does it mean to you? What does love mean to you? What's it look like to you? So I have them draw that picture. Uh, one of the ones I used to always get was uh, a dollar sign, right? They draw a dollar sign under the recognition and achievement part of that or under the, well, yeah, under that part. And um, I would say, no, you know, the, you know, this is a symbol. So then they got smart and then they just started drawing hundred dollar bills. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, that's still symbolic. What, what would the money buy you? If you had the money, what would you get with it? What would that mean to you? So, uh, so we still go to that. The freedom ones oftentimes, because a lot of the people I deal with are uh, in correctional counseling and things like that, uh, oftentimes the freedom ones are very interesting. And that's where I get my works of art, right? I get like, there was one with a fist with a big manacle around it with a chain hanging off of it. It was breaking the chain and things like this. And I was like, you know, the last time they used those manacles was in the 1800s. So that's symbolic. <laughs> What does freedom mean to you? What would you be doing if you were free, if you weren't on probation, if you weren't in jail? What would you be doing? What would that mean to you? So, uh, but those pictures can get very, you know, we have a picture of somebody kicking down a wall or something like that. And it's like, okay, but you're not gonna do that. So what does that mean? What would you do with that? And they say, well, I don't know how to, I don't know how to draw it. I, I wouldn't stay here in the county. If I was on probation, I'd be going someplace else. So that's uh, okay. We'll draw that. Draw yourself in a car and the city limit sign there, right? You're going to have this because that's really what would be happening. Uh, so I'll just have them do that. So uh, those, like I said, those can open up some other conversations about what people want in their life. And um, I had one, I had one guy one time who uh, power was uh, power was a machine gun, and uh, freedom was a grave. And uh, I said, so, so what is, what is this all about? What does this mean? And he said, well, this, he said, uh, you know, I'm a drug dealer and that's, that's what I do. So power was the gun, right? You know, Mao Zedong, right? Power comes from the barrel of a gun. And, and the grave was the only way I see myself getting out of this life is when I'm dead. So certainly that uh, opened up some things for therapy there that we could talk about. Uh, okay. Also in the book, there's another part of that on the WDEP cycle, of course, uh, and, and the book has eight lessons and it just goes around pretty much, you know, the brain is a control system and, and working through, working through all that stuff. Uh, I use that as the WDEP system simply because we spend a lot of time in substance abuse and criminal conduct talking about thinking errors and doing cognitive restructuring and things like this. And whenever I ask them, so what are you doing about this? They say, well, I'm working on my thinking. And I have to go back and say, no, no, that's not the wheel we're working on. We're working on the behavior wheel right now. What are you actually physically doing? What is your behavior? Uh, so I changed that to WBEP. Uh, I don't think Bob uh, Wobelding minds. Uh, haven't heard from him anyway. Uh, <laughs> over the, all the years that I've been doing this. Uh, plus, I, you know, I was just thinking, I was thinking, you know, it's probably only us old timers who remember uh, where he got that, you know, WDEP in Cincinnati, right? Is that's what he came up with, the WDEP in Cincinnati, which was a play on that old sitcom WKRP in Cincinnati. So these days, nobody knows what WKRP in Cincinnati was, except those of us who maybe used to watch it on television. So, so I don't think anybody minds that I'm using the WDEP and focusing on behavior in this particular case. 
But other than that, we look at thinking choices, we look at action choices, uh, we look at choices and consequences, we do cost benefit analysis on all this stuff. I'll also use uh, Bob's 72 questions on figuring out what people want, right? He has the 72 questions to figure out what you want. And then I also use something called the rule of six, okay? Now, the rule of six is an American Indian problem solving method. Uh, it's the cognitive aspect of that. They have a behavioral one as well. Uh, but uh, the rule of six says that for any situation that I find myself in, there are at least six different ways to look at it. There's probably 60, but there's at least six. Uh, and whichever way I choose of those six is my reality of the situation. Uh, so to sort of get this uh, um, idea across and what have you, we call have what's called Granny Wilson's Tale, which is uh, an American Indian learning story that we use. Um, so the rule of six is, uh, is very useful as well, because one of the problems, uh, you know, work, working in corrections, you know, in the 70s, it was nothing works. Now the research never said nothing works, but it sort of became a byword, nothing works in corrections. Uh, and then in the 80s and the 90s, we started to put together some evidence-based practices, some evidence-based literature uh, on into the 2000s and what have you. And, and we do know now what works and what works with this particular population, which is substance abuse and criminal conduct is uh, cognitive restructuring, social skills and problem solving. For whatever reason, they didn't get those skills growing up, okay? Uh, maybe they didn't get it from their parents. Maybe they just weren't interested in it at the time. Whatever the reason, problem uh, solving, cognitive restructuring, and social skills, they didn't get. And we know that if we teach, the, teach them these things, the recidivism rate goes down. So we, so we know that that has something, something to do with it. So uh, when they come to problem solving, if you ask them to come up with six ways to do something, six different ways to look at something, they might come up with two and both of them are bad. <laughs> so, so really getting with the problem solving is that, okay, well, we can use those two, but let's try to come up with four that might get us closer to what we actually want, right? Uh, so uh, like I said, we do that through that uh, American Indian learning uh, tool, uh, Granny Wilson's Tale. Uh, which looks at um, a young woman who's experienced some things that she'd probably be uh, described as a bipolar one uh, in today's diagnosis. But from the Indian standpoint, uh, it's very different uh, that she's special. There, she has special abilities. She has something for the community to learn from and the things that she suffers and the things that she goes through and that uh, having them support her and what have you. So Granny Wilson still, that's something that we need, uh, something that we use to look at, um, look at that. Okay, then of course, there's an evaluation part of that, uh, the evaluation part of it at the very end, which evaluates the program. Uh, and once again, that picture has nothing to do with the evaluation part of it, uh, except to say, uh, that we know that we can do spec scans like this. We can look at the healthy brain. And then those two other ones, the one at the side and the one at the bottom are both uh, brain of a marijuana user. 28, there is a 28 years old, 10 years of mostly weekend use with marijuana. So we can see what that does to the brain. Uh, but if we look at it the other way, we know that treatment, if we evaluate this treatment that we give them, we know that uh, it goes to the other way as well, that that brain, that uh, crumpled up brain can go back to looking like that healthy brain. Okay, so uh, so we know that as far as evaluation goes. Uh, and then I have them evaluate the program. The eighth lesson is an evaluation. What did you learn from the program? What would you like to learn from the program? You know, um, <laughs> uh, what could the uh, what could the facilitator have done to make the program better? Th those sorts of things where they just go through and they evaluate what's going on for the entire program, make any suggestions that they might have. So, okay, that's it. That's what I've got. That's the program that I use. Uh, and I can, you want me to stop sharing, Mona? Yes, please. Okay, all right. Yes, wow. That was a lot of really deep stuff in a short period of time. 
Um, would you go back up to the very beginning and explain to us how pictures get into our quality world? Sure. I mean, if we look at it from a, a physiological perspective, then what what happens is is that you know anything that meets our needs gets to be a picture in the quality world. It has to go through the everything I know world, and then it gets if it you know if it's everything I know but it doesn't meet my needs, then eventually we'll lose that. What happens is when we talk about pictures in the quality world, really what we're talking about is long term memory. Okay, we're talking about those neurons in the brain that uh, are associative, that it's long term memory is what it is, because pictures in the quality world don't ever go away, right? They may fade, just like that's why we use pictures, right? They may fade over time, their strength becomes less and what have you. But no doubt all of us can remember our first love, right? Even though, even though we may have no love for them anymore, we still remember that, right? Because human beings have the ability to, to reminisce. Uh, so those sorts of, any, and every time we reminisce, every time we think about that, that strengthen those, those neurons in the brain. If we don't use them, if they get into everything we know world and we don't ever use them again because they have no meaning to us, then the glial cells will come by and prune those neurons off and we'll, we'll just forget about it uh, as, as we go. But uh, anytime we do something that fulfills our needs, it causes us to feel good, right? That's happiness. That's, that's pleasure. That's, what, that's how it gets into the quality world. That's how it sticks in long-term memory, right? It causes us pleasure or it causes us uh, some, some sort of happiness. Now, uh, it doesn't get in the quality world if it causes us pain or misery, which is the opposite of that, except if it's a survival need, okay? Survival needs tend to be the opposite. Things that hurt us tend to actually, things that cause us misery actually tend to get in there. So you stick your uh, hand on a stove you didn't like that. You didn't want that. Okay. But uh, that sticks in our <laughs> quality world, right? I have a picture of my quality world that says, do not do that. Okay. And the reason it does, because the need that it fulfills is the survival need. Okay. And this is sort of what I talked about last time when I talked about sort of like PTSD and things like that. People say, well, I don't want these uh, reactions that I'm getting. I don't want these thoughts. But, you know, what, how does this fulfill my, fulfill my needs? How is this making me feel happy? It's not, it's not fulfilling your psychological needs. What it's fulfilling is this, the survival need that says, this is what, and once again, the brain sort of makes a mistake. And this is what, uh, you know, it says, whatever you were doing at the time seemed to work for you because you lived. So all that anxiety that you had when this happened, all that stress, all that anxiety that you had must have had something to do with your survival. So anytime I <laughs> so survival again, I go on. back to that, I go back to that, right? <laughs> Yeah, uh, but uh, but generally, if it's not the survival need, if we're dealing just with the psychological needs, then anything that causes that feeling of happiness, that euphoria, that feeling of pleasure, that's what that's how it gets into the quality world. Those neurons in the brain are strengthened uh, in that, and um, and they and they stay there. Otherwise, they're pruned off by the glial cells. Yeah. So whenever you have them take a piece of paper, draw four of the you know, what are the most important things to you? And then which one could you give up? Right. And how that we trick ourselves. We often lie to ourselves. Sometimes uh, you have to be very careful with this game and remember who you're working with <laughs> because people will try to cheat on it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, sometimes people will say, you know, oftentimes what will happen is I'll, I'll say one to 10 on all of these. And uh, they'll come up with a 10 on all, of, all four of them, okay? And, that, and I say, that's fine. We're going we're gonna to work that out in just a minute because you're going to have to give one of them up, mm. right? <laughs> so, so that one's going to be lower automatically in the list, and we'll just continue to go down as we go through the other ones. Uh, so it sort of shakes itself out that way. But um, uh, usually they're pretty, I mean, if, if they're not trying to cheat like that, and sometimes they'll say, well, if I, if I can't get this need met in belonging, I'll get it met in recognition. It's like, no, no, two separate cups, right? You can't, one's not gonna fill the other one. Yeah. Uh, but they're usually, I mean, they'll go along with it. They'll, they're most of the time, most everybody who does it, uh, they might try, I mean, they try to think of it and often they're surprised because they say, you know, this, like I said, we start the game with what is your need strength, 
across. And so they really think that that's, you know, the power and control. That's my, that's my highest need right there. But they find out that they give that up somewhere along the way because they want to keep what's under the uh, belonging, what's under the, you know, affiliation thing that's there. So, uh, so can they, can they fool themselves? Well, most of the time they're trying to fool somebody else if they're doing it, but I think they're fairly honest with it. I mean, I, I'll trust them the, unless I have a reason not to. Yeah, yeah. Well, 22 years ago, uh, whenever you were going for certification, I was privileged to be when you were doing your training to say for input from others as to what you were doing and that choosing wisely was wonderful and everything that you're continuing to bring to us is equally wonderful. So thank you very, very much. And one more thing I want to say that I mean, I am just blown away by the fact that you will not allow people to use symbols. I mean, they have to strip down as to what they really mean. Right. That that yeah. is deep, 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 deep. Well, well, I mean, I can't help them. I can't help them get to what they want. I mean, you can't get a symbol, right? I mean, what does that symbol really mean to you? What is? I mean, how do you? How do you? You know, what? What is that? Um, so only then, only then can I know how to, you know, use the procedures that lead to change to help them get it. If right. it's a symbol, I, you know, I don't, I don't know how to help you get that. I don't. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we're going to go ahead and close out the meeting. And those of you that are present, stay around and we'll have some dialogue with Ron. So uh, thank you for being here and good mental health.